on the second anniversary of what is almost certainly the largest man-made ecological disaster, Russia's destruction of the Kovka Dam, a new and innovative campaign has been launched to try and draw the world's attention to what Russia did a year ago in Ukraine. We are still trying to prove what military objectives Russia might have had to do it. We're still trying to piece together the details of their actions, but there can be no doubt that Russia was the aggressor and the instigator of this huge man-made catastrophe. Today, I'm talking to Al Young and Stephen Lacey, two of the brains behind this campaign to raise awareness. First of all, I'm going to chuck the question out there about the motivations. It might seem the motivations are clear, but why this event prompting such organisation as opposed to many of the other crimes Russia has committed over the last two and a bit years? I'm a strong activist uh, involved in Ukraine. I speak a lot of the rallies, heavily support the Ukrainian Institute, doing a master's in Ukrainian history and politics at the School of Foreign Studies and also run an e-cultural insight agency. When the war originally happened, I made a promise that I'd do everything in my power to help Ukraine, not just for the war, but also for the rest of my lifetime. And I remember... A year ago, when Kokovka happened, I was kind of shell-shocked and there was just very little noise about it. And for the past kind of year, I've been hearing from environmentalists about everything else, about oil and about gas and about the problems of the kind of environment. But it seemed the environmentalists were kind of silent and it seemed that people were silent. And as you said, this is the biggest disaster of ecology for kind of 10 years and, and, and kind of by Russia. So I went to a Ukrainian Institute event and I saw Oli Hercules talk and also Anna Ackman. Anna Ackman really laid out what was going on and the kind of damage. And then Oli just spoke to my heart and, and just with a lot of power because she's from that region and she could talk about the history of that region and the damage of that region and how memories have kind of kind of disappeared and this kind of been kind of destroyed and and the, the ultimate kind of destruction of, of what had kind of happened. And in many ways, Russia's like the four horsemen, right? It's it's kind of done lingual side, cultural side, genocide, but no one really talks about kind of eco side. And I walked out of that and I thought, I really want to do something. So I've got Work for advertising agencies. I used to work for advertising agencies myself for a number of kind of years. Reached out to my contact books, spoke to a number of agencies. But one of the things was one of the things about advertising is they got very excited, not excited, but very talking and uh, about Ukraine for a month when the war happened. And then they it's kind of the new shiny things. And the guys at St. Luke's were the guys that were like, yes, I really kind of want to get involved in this. This is really, really important. And I, I remember Al sharing you the video of Ola, Ola Hercules talking and, and just the pure kind of emotion and, and the pure kind of rationale. And I was like, I want to do something. Like ecocide's not on the radar. No one's talking about it. And no one's lobbying the courts to make this change. So I approached Al. And maybe Al, you want to talk about your kind of reasons as well and why, why you got behind the campaign. Yeah, well, well my, my first my first reason, Steve, is you yourself. I I'm always I've always been an enormous admirer of Steve's work as a researcher. He un, he uncovers he's brilliant at, at uncovering genuine human insights. He understands what it what it means to be human. And so I've always got I always love to, whenever he's speaking or wherever he's talking, I'll, I'll always come along and listen to the events that he holds. So I'm a huge admirer of him professionally. In terms of the issue, I know exactly what Steve means about it was fashionable to care about Ukraine. It was fashionable, and, and, and as it's fashionable now to care about Gaza. And I know I'm being so, that's a very gauche and simplistic thing to say, but there's, there's a certain amount of truth to it. And, and and the attention has shifted away from what's going on to Ukraine. So that made me interested, interested as well. But it was it was the ecocide angle 
that I found the most compelling. I thought it was an incredibly clever thing to do to create a campaign that's targeting the internet, effectively targeting the International Law Commission. Who's, who, who's, who, um, and then, of course, the International Criminal Courts act out their statutes. So that's such a tiny, a tiny weeny target audience is a very, very interesting brief, isn't it? And then there is the ecological aspect of it. Well, that's my, my third reason is the ecological aspects of it. So I am a fly fisherman. And as a fly fisherman, you care profoundly about the health of water. So I will take about three or four days of holiday every year to jump into rivers and build, build organic um, silt catchers that helps to purify the water. So it's all about trying to extract unwanted matter in, wa in, in, in water to create the purest ecosystems, we, um, um, aquatic ecosystems we can. So I care about the health of water. So it spoke to me there as well. There's so many different angles to pick up, but there's there's two that I want to follow on with next. We'll come to the media silence in a minute because that is profoundly disturbing, actually. For somebody who was also following this in detail, I certainly had uh, an inclination that, that, that they would do this. John Sweeney's written extensively about uh, how Putin is, is bound to do this. Um, so it came as no surprise, but just the scale of it was horrific. But what was what was shocking was the silence. But we'll, we'll come to the media aspect in a minute. But I'm very, very interested in this idea that this isn't just a campaign to target millions of people or the pro-Ukrainian bubble or introduce the topic to people who haven't discovered it before. Um, that's great and laudable, and hopefully that is a side effect of the campaign. But you're specifically taking action to try and change international law. And as you say, it's a small number of legislators and experts who you're trying to reach. That That's a tough brief, isn't it? Um, and a straightforward one. And we're not going to drive... We're not going to drive the nail all the way in, but we do present a, a tap of it, another tap. And that's and, and that's the most we can hope for. But of course, the great thing about it is you don't need, you know, you, you, it doesn't, we, we didn't have a budget. We didn't have a cent. We didn't have a single penny in budgets. So the more focus we could make it, the better. One of the challenges, of course, here is there are so many different ways to tackle this creatively. But what we've seen and what we've just discussed is the sort of media silence on the event. And there were plenty of human stories at the time. So the obvious angle is to say, look at the human implications, the cost and the sheer you know, life lost and wildlife lost as well and the human tragedy. But we already know the media is almost immune to that and didn't take the bait. Um, so how did you approach this creative campaign on the understanding that media and experts are potentially not, not tuned in to this topic? I mean, I mean, from my position, I think it was having something fresh and different and a different kind of angle. And you and the human cost, I mean, the human cost in Ukraine is 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 unbelievable. And We've seen that a lot on the news, but and sadly, since Gaza, it's been kind of dropping off. Unfortunately, with a lot of British people in a cost of living crisis and a lot of darkness on the news, that there's a tuning out of the kind of news, which I see time and time in kind of research. But one thing English people do care about a lot is, is, is kind of animals. And in a way, we want to kind of give the invisible voices of the animals a voice. And, and have nature as that kind of voice because the destruction, I mean, it was an animal set cemetery, right? It created an animal cemetery. There were birds that are nesting, their chicks were completely drowned. Fish were being pushed and pushed into the Black Sea. The freshwater fish, they just, they're just completely kind of destroyed. You've got things like the mouse, the Norman mouse, which 70% of, of the population is in that kind of, kind of area. And this animal cemetery, Cemetery was really created, and I think it was about how can we give the animals 
the voice or have a different approach yeah. to really cut through that media in a very, very diff different way. Yes, more than that, I think more than a voice, Steve, I think is is to give them real, to give them jurisdiction. Absolutely. To give them jurisdiction. Nature can stand. Imagine a world where nature, this silent, this silent victim that we can that we can abuse all we like without consequences. But imagine it could stand in judgment of us. What would it have to say to us? I think that's why the that's why the idea is successful. It makes you imagine what would nature have to say to me in my behaviours. Do you know what I mean? And of course, what would it have to say to the perpetrators of of, of, of the destruction of the dam? And that's I think is what what's powerful about it. I wanted to pick up as well, Steve, on what you were what, what you were actually both saying about the human tragedy. The fact of it is, our imaginations aren't powerful enough to imagine the human tragedy. It's, it would be unbearable. If we were able to really fully imagine that human tragedy, we wouldn't be able to leave the house. We wouldn't get out of bed. We, we have defence mechanisms in it to stop us seeing the human tragedy. Have you noticed how like, people get much more upset about when the, when the zoo was bombed when bombs fell on the zoo rather than when they fell on fell on children and families, for instance. That's because it's easier to imagine. It's, it's more comfortable to, 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 to allow your empathy and your compassion to be felt for some zoo animals. And so there is a there is a kind of a necessity, I think, to go at it this way. It's going to make people feel more when we talk about the animals. It's a fine line uh, between um, humanizing the animals and giving them some kind of human agency, which is the striking image you've created. And of course, people are seeing these images in, in, in the video as, as, as we proceed here. But there's a fine line because it could become comical. It could be it could lose that impact. Uh, you know, how were you able to, to handle that in the creative process? Um, I, well, I think. Anthropomorphism is a, it, 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 we've seen it, we've grown up with, we've seen it in our books, you know, Paddington Bear, you know, and, and it can be cutesy, can't it? But let's remember that we are also trained to fear the idea of standing in front of a judge. None of us want to be in that position to have a judge standing over us, knowing that we're, we're going to be found wanting. So, so I think I think the power of that takes away. If, if again, I mean, we could edit this out, but for me, the fish was the most successful one because we made his him look very, very severe. We 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 retouched his brow to make him look at you know, you know, look at you in a very stern and accusatory way. I think had I had more money and time, each expression on those animals' faces would be as stern and as judgmental as possible but i still think the energy the energy is still coming through it's good enough you know given the i mean and i've got to sort of forgive myself given the constraints we all had but i would have i would have loved to make them all much fiercer still cute little still the cute little mouse etc but give them but make them make them frightening make them sterner and the, and i think just the idea of for nature kind of looking at you, judging you for the actions is, is so important. In a yes. way, na nature's judging everything we do. Nature's judging Russia. And I think that's that's an important, very kind of important element for everything that they've done across the multiple different kind of sides that they've done from genocide, lingual side, culture side. Now they're doing eco side as well. There's there's kind of kind of no kind of stopping them. And I think that awareness has to be brought in many different ways. And I think the other thing was, this was an ecocide campaign. So this was about nature. And that was a tight brief. I think we, obviously if we were doing a genocide campaign or a lingual side or a cultural side, yeah. it would have shown would have shown shown the people. We also soundboarded with with the Ukrainian community as well, who are absolutely amazing and really, really supportive on this journey all the way through. Yes. I think this is the reason why, as I said at the start, I'm such an admirer of Steve. There's an old, there's an old kind of. I, I, I believe it's attributed um, to David Ogilvy, but he said, "Give me the freedom of a tight brief." 
And that's exactly what Steve gave us with the Seeker Side Brief. It's what makes it such a fantastic, it's what makes it a, a constant delight to work with. But it's, I'm just going backwards a little bit here, but interestingly, my, my first thought was a crime against nature is a crime against the whole world. Because it's true, isn't it? If you, if you unleash um, um, ecological devastation at scale, it's going to affect the water table. It's going to affect the atmosphere. It's going to have it's going to have a knock on effect on, on on the entire planet, and so I was fooling around with these ideas of people who were who were kind of half animal, half people, and it was just. And then I I, I chatted about it to Julian Vizard, who I've worked with for thirty years, and she said, "No, no, it's, it's way too wide. It's all about the judges," and of course he was one hundred percent right. And it's a tricky one, isn't it, to sell because of course. Ukrainians, rightly, they are very resilient, but their first thoughts are with people, with humans. Um, but what you're trying to do is pass a specific piece of legislation. It's another angle to put pressure on Russia now uh, to prov hopefully make it accountable for its actions that it's already done and make it think twice about future environmental desecration. Um, but this is also, I assume, a process about looking forward to future wars, future tyrants, to make them think twice about the consequences of such actions. And that, that's why it's so important, because I believe yeah. I'm aware that it, it's retrospective, yeah? So so, so the new law, would, if ecocide coming, it applies to, to the kind of the kind of future law. So that's really important. It's, is creating that kind of marker of change. It's interesting you said you said, said about the, the Ukrainian community. To be honest, we, we checked this with the Ukrainian community and they, they were incredibly supportive. I think they understood that this was a different angle and a, and a different way in. Yes. And one of the amazing things about Ukrainians and the, the Ukrainians I know here as the activists especially is they'll always try new things, yeah? And they're constantly trying new things. They're constantly trying to adapt to make sure that Ukraine is constantly in in the news and not in in, in the minds of people and in public kind of focus. And I think this was just another way that we could try and help that and achieve that. I think that's right. And and in the, 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 there's the retrospective angle, but there is, as Jonathan says, the future too, because you know renewables, renewable energy sources. So, uh, um, and, and our ideas about sustainability, currently there are some big sort of technical limitations to it. So we are likely, we are likely looking at a nuclear power renaissance. And we know already there are key, there, there are key nuclear power, um, power plants in, in the Ukraine. And if those, so, so if people think they can get away with striking those, striking nuclear power power plants we're, 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 we're into multi-generational ecological catastrophe and, and and that's the important thing because the next line they've blown up they've blown up the dam right they flooded the dam they've blown up the dam the next step will be a nuclear they will they will try it that they will and that's and everyone will suddenly wake up and it's like but it'll be too late and that's why ecocide is so important so we stop it now evil and brutality now it doesn't keep crossing the lines and this is you know this is going to stray slightly outside of the area of this discussion but if anything what we're seeing now unfold in ukraine and this is the third year of war it's a failure of deterrence and at the moment there is impunity to destroy the environment because there is no recognizable framework to prosecute people who intentionally use the environment for military or autocratic advantage. Absolutely. And those deterrents have to be be put into kind of place. Because they don't <coughs> they don't care about humans and they don't care about land and they don't care about water. They don't care about anything. And that it's just uh just a kind of roving destruction without any thought care because no one's stopping them no one's talking about it 
Well, the last question really um, is the campaign came out uh, yesterday. It was it was the anniversary of uh, the uh, destruction of the dam. It's a curious irony that it also occurs on D-Day. And one suspects that in Russia, things often don't happen by accident. In fact, there is symbolism in, in dates like this. Um, what do you hope to the impact will be? I mean, what's the impact being so far? Where do you hope this will go? And what's next for you in terms of the follow-up from the creative of the campaign that was released? The impact has been extraordinarily good. I was saying to Steve earlier on, we have a um, 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 a got uh, an award, a gold award-winning campaign for Ocado that was we got the awards last night. Uh, when we released that film and the and, and news the award to the to our kind of to, to our own LinkedIn community. We got we got a decent response. We got a much much better response to the work we did for Stop Ecocide because because it's not um, because it catch it genuinely seems to capture imagination. It's been on a number of um, domestic and international sites for around creativity, including Ads of the World, which is which is pretty extraordinary given all that is is it, is, is it some social media posts? That's all it is. A few social media posts. That's in, that, 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 to my mind, is incredible traction. So in one day, we've seen um, these posts outperform things that have been around for several weeks. So that that's very gratifying. In 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 terms of the, and I think it will still continue to grow for a while yet. It'll start to often as not these things continue to um, uh, uh, um to um to grow before they before they fade. The 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 other thing in terms of a, a next move, what I'm what we're really hoping to, to see done is to see um um, so, um see the performer not the performer the Ukrainian performance artists have a regular slot on Parliament Green. It would be great that we, we, we've looked into sourcing the judges out um, the judicial robes. We've looked into sourcing some animal masks. We think that can create another great photo op on Parliament um, on Parliament Green. Um, and we'd love to see that happen. And I agree. I, th I mean, I think the response has been really good. I know the Ukrainian media have picked it up. We've appeared in a number of kind of creative kind of magazines as well, which is absolutely fantastic. We got a lot of support from great organisations like Women Fighting for Ukraine, the Ukraine Institute, a lot of senior kind of influencers were kind, kind of posting it. And I think also for Ukrainians, I think, I think they're happy that not happy, but they like the fact that it's people that care, and we do care. Me and Al care, and we care about Ukraine, and we care about ecocide. And I don't want, I don't want the memory of Kokovka to fade. I think the memory should be constantly kept alive and constantly kind of talked about, because I think every year it should be in memorial. People should remember another aspect of, of what Russia's done and its kind of destruction. And I think that memory needs to be, the candle needs to be kept alive for the people, for the animals and for Ukraine. And I sincerely hope the campaign achieves that. Anyone watching this on Silicon Curtain, I definitely implore you to reshare these materials. The anniversary may have passed, but this is an evergreen story. This is something that must be amplified and discussed. And of course, those who perpetrated it eventually, we hope, will be brought to account. But ecocide laws uh, and designating it as an international war crime could help prevent such tragedies and deter the ruinous actions of dictators such as Vladimir Putin. Uh, Stephen and Al, I'm so grateful to you for all the work that you're doing and, of course, for appearing on the channel today. Thank you very much. Pleasure, Jonathan. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for hosting.